Yeah, so I made the mistake of Googling like gun facts in the USA. Yeah. USA, USA gun facts. Yeah. Yeah, it's not pretty, man. I made a little, I made a very poorly user designed graphic this morning uh, because I was, I wanted to see the correlation between some of those USA gun facts and maybe Mm -hmm. other statistics that commonly might correlate to things that come up in, in the conversations that crop up when we're talking about this. What, so what, it was a poorly designed graphic or something? Oh, I just made it in Excel and used... Oh, you do everything in Excel. Yeah. I like it, <laughs> My my step up from Excel is PowerPoint, and I didn't even use PowerPoint. That's as high as it goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did use Snagit, but only to snag the, the table in Excel. So it's like paint. If I had paint on my computer, I would have used that. Oh, Microsoft well, paint. yeah, who wouldn't? What'd you, what, what did you find... Oh, so top 10 civilian gun owning countries, um, you know, top 10, top 10. Okay. I want to guess what number two is. Well, yeah, we're number one, obviously. <laughs> and I'm just going to look at the map because I, I don't even know what countries are, there are. Um, but I'm going to guess it's per capita. Yep. Per hundred, per hundred. Estimated number of firearms per 100 residents. Colombia, that's my guess. Not even in the top 10. Okay. Then that was racist, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, it, I, it's, a, it's a good guess, I mean, based on the amount of crime. But I think Colombia is one of those places where the number, amount of crime happens because of a small number of people. Right. That's a good, that's a good point. Uh, Yemen is number two. Oh, I wasn't even thinking right? that part of the world. Okay. So U- USA has 120 guns per 100 people. <laughs> yep. 20% more guns than we have people in this country. <laughs> Yemen was a 52. <laughs> so number two is less than half. Yemen. What? What? Who else makes the top 10 list? Serbia and Montenegro are both <laughs> at 39 Uruguay and Canada are both at 34. Cyprus is also at 34. Finland, 32. Lebanon, 31. And Iceland, 31. Iceland? That's not fair. That means they have five guns in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd love to go to Iceland. You drop a gun in Iceland and that number triples. <laughs> and Wow. I mean, this is sad, like, more than half of the guns, gun-related deaths in the U.S. are suicide. Yeah, that that's actually one that I saw a while ago. And I was looking at, I think it's, I'm probably wrong about this. I think it's the FBI that keeps crime statistic data. Mm-hmm. And you can really dive deep into that data. I believe it takes them a while to compile it. So it's not like you, you can look at 2022 so far. But... Um, right. You can look at all crimes of all types, but then also crimes with subtypes like violent crime involving a gun or not. And the question that I asked the data was, are you more likely to die by your own gun or by somebody else's gun? Interesting. And you're significantly more likely to die by your own gun than somebody else's gun. The homicide rate, uh, you know, firearm um, homicides per year is dwarfed by firearm suicides per year. Wow. Yeah. Um, Which is a really sad thing. I think. uh, Well, it's just so easy. I mean, pull trigger. You don't have time to second guess yourself. And there's not like, You don't you don't come back from that you know yeah. um, or end up in the ER or something. So we are killing ourselves literally, mm-hmm. but also making it 120 guns per per or 1.2 guns per person. Right. Which is, you know, like we're it's so baked into our culture this argument, um, 
the Columbine shooting is is basically my early childhood. Practically, I, I'm pretty sure I was yeah. in fourth grade or fifth grade, and so my entire life, I've been having this debate, and depending on what year it was, having it from another side. Yeah, but I think one thing that we lose sight of there's all kinds of like crime is messy, uh, violence is messy, but we are extreme outliers compared to the rest of the world. So our problems have been either don't happen in other countries or if they did happen, they have been solved. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that I think it's important for people to know is this is a uniquely American problem. Yeah, it is. This isn't, you know, the, my, and my graphic I had put together, the idea I was trying to convey is that like people are p- very similar the world throughout. So the, the rate of mm-hmm. mental illness is pretty constant. Um, yeah. Really, the only reason you see it drop, you, you tend to see it drop down as GDP goes down, which probably just means they don't have quite the systems to help people or record that somebody is getting help for mental illness. Right. Not that they're not there, right? And the stats I've seen combine mental illness with substance abuse, which are maybe kind of, maybe substance abuse being a subset of mental illness. Mm -hmm. But the rates of mental illness around the world, especially in the, in the first world are 15%, pretty, pretty stable. Mm. The rate. And then the, the next thing I tried to do was, what is the rate of sinful people around the world? <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. <laughs> yeah, uh. <laughs> it's a, it's pretty constant. It's a pretty constant number. Um, so I sh- what I should have used was um, like percent Christian or regular church attending. Mm. That maybe would have been a more powerful statistic since it's not made up. Yeah. But what I hear a lot is that it's a, anytime this happens, it's a, that it's a sin problem. And it is a sin problem. Sure. But uh, it's not just that one person's sin problem at this point. It's it's our collective sin problem that we are okay with this. Yeah. And if, if, it, if the problem was sin and the solution is we need to convert more people to Christianity, we live in one of the most Christian country, nations in the world, mm-hmm. right? That we would not be the outlier in, in shooting deaths if you looked at just what percentage of people are Christians, or if you really wanted to go down that road, right, you end up in Rwanda, which was statistically reported something ridiculous, like 99% Christian Hmm. the year before the genocide happened in Rwanda, where Uh, one half of the country uh, systematically murdered the other half. So, yeah. um, Like, the international comparison of gun related killings as a percentage of all homicides. Oh, wait, so okay. International, so gun killings as a percentage of homicides. Okay, yeah. They just have the, so it's just like four samples. So the US, you know, we think of ourselves very similar to Canada. Yeah. And then, then they have Australia and the UK. So. Homo- percent of homicides in the U.S. seventy nine percent is gun related. Canada thirty seven percent. Australia thirteen percent, and in the U.K. four hmm. percent. And those those con- like the U.K. and Australia are not famously Christian nations. They now anyway. And then the so I, I the other number you need with that is is the per capita homicide rate similar or is it lower? So I'm just going to look at that real quick. Oh, like so, period. Yeah. So because there's right, the argument, right, right. you take away the guns, we just find a different way to kill each other. Um, mm-hmm. So in the U.S., I'm going to make sure this is real. Okay, 2017 data, homicide rate five. I'm pretty sure that's per one hundred. Yeah, uh, per 100,000 people, as we're used to seeing deaths reported the last few years. Mm -hmm. So uh, 4.96, so 5 is the homicide rate. Canada, the rate is 1.76. In the UK, it's 1.2. Australia, it's 0.89. Wow. So the 
amount of homicides is significantly higher in the U.S. It's not like they just pick up different weapons. Um, it's like four to five times higher. Yeah. Yeah. It's just too easy to kill somebody with one of those things. Yeah, I, so yeah. I, I thought about this book. I, I've got the book, and I haven't read it yet. It's the When Thoughts and Prayers Are Not Enough uh, by Taylor Schumann. 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 Sure. But uh, they talked about this a while, maybe a year or two ago on the Holy Post podcast. Yeah. And it was really good. This gal was, you know, she went through a, a school shooting herself, or I mean, not a school, maybe it was her office or something. I don't know. I thought I wanted to talk about this, but now I'm just getting depressed. <laughs> because yeah. it's like every time this happens, people get all upset and things happen you know are said and nothing happens and then it happens again in just last, last 10 days ago we had the shooting in buffalo new york i do not have hope that our country is going to get this right i do not yeah. think that we will i think that we will f- add to the gun violence with just infighting between our tribes every time of one is big enough to make the news and and shock Mm -hmm. us all a little bit. And then we will go back to our regular lives until the next one with a very small minority passionately trying to change something, but maybe most of us not thinking about it and those in power being incentivized not to do anything. And a listener beat me to this, but I had the idea too. I I claim uh, equal credit or (laughs) co-credit, but it, what it made me think of was child sacrifice in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Because when you reading about that, it's so uh, unhuman and it's so disconnected and foreign. And they're like idols are a thing that feel so not modern. Like I don't feel tempted to sacrifice anything to an idol. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't feel tempted to worship a, a bronze statue of a, of a goat God or something. Mm hmm. And so it almost seems like hyperbole when, when I'm reading those stories of not only the, the evil nations around Israel, but even Israel starting to do these things mm-hmm. like child sacrifices to Molech or Baal or whatever. Mm-hmm. The question that came up this week for me is, I wonder what they got for those child sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Like what? Is it the God of war that they're set? Are they trying to expand their land? Is it like the God of fertility or rain? Are they trying to be richer? Is it the, like the bull God of power? And what is the thing that for them was so much more important that they were willing to kill their children in order to get it? And is that not what we are doing collectively? Mm. Yeah. You know, that we, we don't walk them to an altar, um, but but we have elevated things to be more important than that. Yeah, we're um, willingly letting it happen. Yeah. Probably, you know, and for like, politically speaking, maybe power, but I feel like you can see it happen at the system level more than the individual level because like Mm -hmm. people who own guns, individuals who own guns that I know are not evil people. They're not uh, child murderers. Right. But the the amount the gun represents something more than a gun right. to them. That is something that I've seen you, uh, nearly universally yeah. is that is a really important gun. I see a, you know, probably from my cold dead fingers or molten Abbey, or is that it? Molten Abbey, um, sticker on trucks multiple times a day. Yeah. Right. Um, and the, what they, what that sticker means is if you take my gun, I will kill you trying. Yeah, this piece of metal is more important than your life. Yes, yes. Yeah, and it's like like nobody asked them a question. Like, did I didn't knock on the the their truck and say like, "Hey, sir, could I please have your weapon?" And he was like, "You know, scram." It's just broadcast <laughs> to the world. Like, hey, by the way, nobody's asking me this, but I, I will murder kill, you. <laughs> I, yeah, but I will murder you if you take this thing away from me. That's how important it is. It's like, oh, is that like how you feed your family and you, you know, like? No, I just really like it. It makes me feel like a man because I played with G.I. Joe as a kid. And uh, it makes me feel like, 
you know, I'll protect myself if the government ever becomes tyrannical. You know, little did they know that it turns out the people with all the guns are the ones in favor of the tyrannical government in the first place, right? And they're the ones that we need to worry about storming the Capitol. So, like, those are the same people. Um, but this fantasy of I'm going to shoot somebody to protect my family in towns like we live in where that doesn't happen or or just like the, you know, I'm going to have 10 guns in just in case something. So that individuals are not evil individuals, but the thing that I am describing is evil that has seeped into our society on a, maybe on a system level. And I own, I have, I own gun, I'm a gun owner and I understand the, you know, I, I did, um, hunter safety as a, as a kid and, um, you know, I, I grew up with guns being a normal part of life, meaning, well, they they were never normal. It was still like hidden away in a closet. But now I've seen it become more and more worshipped and elevated. So it's not just we have a few discreet hunting rifles in the closet that we are lock up and are careful with, but it's, you know, people open carrying as a provocation or defending their right to have those individually uh, even if maybe that that could be a solution that I don't know maybe ends up with less people getting guns. 120 guns per 100 people is a lot. Yeah, the the whole gun thing is just frustrating. But I, I think you're right. I don't think I don't think it's going to change. And I think that uh, I don't know. It's just one of those things that we have tied it to freedom, which is therefore tied to or becomes tied to the constitution, which people feel like or explicitly claim was basically uh, inspired by God himself, which makes it a religious thing, which makes guns a religious thing. (laughs) And, you know, you start, do you, you do you, once that happens and it has, it has, it has happened. Once that happens, I mean, give up the country's going to have to crash and burn and be started over for, for anything to be done about it. Yeah. It's imagine a, a preacher who was completely orthodox and completely conservative in every way. Yeah. And, but the one place he strayed was he wasn't sure if Christians should own lethal weapons. Maybe Hmm. we should be doing everything we can to, turn swords into plowshares, taking things that are meant for destruction and war, dismantling those things and turning them into things that are for um, production and, and food. I think that, first of all, I think it would it would take a lot of guts to be that preacher and say that out loud. Yeah. I don't see that going over very well, I guess. I, I feel like there are a lot of other positions where you can be a little bit liberal as a preacher. In evangelical uh, Christianity, and that would maybe not be one of them. Yeah, and I think I've said before on the on our podcast at some point that the one class that I had when people when somebody got yelled at me and got up and left was the one class that I mentioned how guns are not as important as people. Uh, and that's basically what I said. And this guy yelled at me and got up and left. So yeah, it's it's become so so connected to. That same gut muscle that feels like our religious gut muscle, and now we can't tell them apart. Yeah. It feels like we're cursed. I have been running almost all my life, but you, you always chase me down. Cursed, is that a thing, Nathan? <laughs> It's a, a thing, thing that I I don't understand, so I need your I need your help a little bit. So I wanted to talk about the curse, um, the curse of the fall, or the fall, and then the curse in Genesis. <laughs> okay. So the I am more familiar with this idea in in general than specifics because I I don't think mm-hmm. as an adult I've spent enough time in uh, Genesis like 
with other Christians in Bible classes. But um, there are these curses in Genesis. Uh, so beginning of the world, Adam and Eve um, are in the garden. They are told they can do a lot of things, but there's one thing they can't do. Uh, that's the fall when, when Eve takes of the forbidden fruit, gives some to Adam. Now sin has entered the world and there are consequences. And in the middle of that, there is a sneaky serpent who is uh, tricking these people. And then there are these curses. So there are these consequences as a result of this uh, disobedience. Yeah, Genesis 3, right? That's what you said? Genesis 3 okay. is where this happens. And I, I vaguely in my mind had remembered what the curse was. Looking back at the, at the verses, the curse is a little bit different than I, I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's basically for curse number one, God, God shows up, Adam and Eve are, are uh, hiding themselves. God says what happened. And then God starts saying um, these curses. So first God says to the serpent, I'll just read it. It's not that long. Uh, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all livestock and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her uh, descendant with a capital D. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So a a very, it feels very ancient, this very poetic curse, the one for the serpent. It even kind of, there's a little bit of a feel of like how the giraffe got its long neck or how the leopard got its spots to it. Yep. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, here's here's why snakes don't have legs. Right. Woven in with some um, messianic prophecy possibly. And it's very cryptic. And, and um, then he, so the next curse is for the woman. And this is where, I've always had questions about these. So the, to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply, I will increase your pain in childbirth, which I've always thought was interesting. Like, would childbirth have been a little bit painful, like in the garden? <laughs> and he was like, now even more, up to 11. Like, it was going to be bad before. <laughs> like, women, even in the Garden of Eve, Garden of Eden, does that is that what the, anyways well, I, mean, I, will, I mean have you have you seen a, a like a cow give birth they're like chewing their cud and no big deal baby comes pops out what like yeah i mean not always <laughs> but interesting i, saw, I've I, never... I, I randomly saw a cow give birth when i was a kid like riding my bike across the farm and then like i looked over and this cow just plopped out of the back <laughs> oh wow just standing there yeah, yeah i've never put that together like i've just assumed it's just bad all around for everybody um, and we just like have adjectives, so we get to complain about it more. <laughs> we meaning women. I don't know anything about, uh, as I'm getting myself into trouble with our, <laughs> that's interesting. So I will greatly multiply, multiply, man, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth In pain. You shall deliver children yet. Your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you, which is the curse of, um, heterosexuality. I'm pretty sure. And then the curse, <laughs> the curse of patriarchy. It's like, now you got to be attracted to men. So look what you've done, Eve. The snake doesn't get legs. You're going to be attracted to your husband. And even though the baby's going to hurt, you still want one. Yep. Um, and then the, for Adam, my Bible breaks up the curse weird. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually add a first curse. That's like not in the poetic language, which is because yeah. you listen to the voice of your wife. That's your wrong thing. Number one, Adam is listening to your wife. Right. Um, and you have eaten uh, f- from the tree and I told you not to. Oh, did I skip? Oh yeah. You shall not eat from it. So um, you shall not eat from it. I think is actually maybe part of it. The curse, mm-hmm. like you're not allowed to eat from the tree and then the ground is cursed because of you. You're going to have to work hard to eat from it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall grow for you. You'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat your bread until you return to the ground because from it you are taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. So the, these like 
very ancient sounding. I think this is what people imagine who did not grow up Christian. Like this is what they imagine just the whole Bible is like. Yeah. Is this kind of stuff. Like here's the rule. Here's the reason. Here's why uh, pain and suffering is in the world. Here's the consequence for what you did. Very interesting stuff. The first thing I noticed that's missing from this is the only one that I, it's the first one I remembered. Like what's the first curse resultant of the fall is death. There's no, nobody dies. Or, or, where is this? Genesis 3. No, no, you said the first curse is death. No, I'm saying uh, I'm surprised that it's not in there because I always well, thought. it's not death. Yeah, it's it's not in there anywhere. Yeah, that's what the the serpent says to Eve. Right? Yeah, he says y- you won't die, and he's he's right. The serpent was right in that instance. Yeah, they did it. True. Um, and then the curse. I just always thought the curse was going to be like, and you die. Hmm. Like that's yeah. part of the curse. And it, 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 I think it is. I think we can piece together that after this, the reason they. Adam and Eve in the story do not live forever anymore is because they are banished from the garden and they can't eat the fruit from the tree of life. Right. So ergo, you can't eat from the tree of life. Therefore, if you're just eating ground thorns and having painful babies, you're going to die. Painful babies. Yeah. And so the reason I was thinking about this is I was actually uh, gardening. Hmm. A lot of my hobbies, most of my hobbies just take place in my mind. I just, I read about <laughs> them like, and that's all. So like yeah, yeah. many of my hobbies are things I'm interested in, but that I don't do. So I'm very interested in uh, pottery and ceramics recently. Haven't yeah. done like touched any clay. I really like, uh, but then most of my hobbies are like making something from the earth in somehow. So I really like gardening and even agriculture. Um, home brewing was like that when I was brewing beer and then keeping bees. And I, I've got this garden going in the back and it, I'm just so bad at gardening that I have all these troubles getting anything to grow. And uh, I planted this new kind of permaculture experiment and I thought I was doing great and it's just all weeds. And mm. I was like, it's because of Adam, you know, it's because of sin that I have crabgrass all over my Hugo Couture um, <laughs> mound. So, so then I was like, wait a minute, is the, are the curses like the good part of God's will or the bad part of God's will? Like are the, are the curses supposed to, am I supposed to be on the side of the curse? Am I pro curse as a kingdom person is god Mm. like pro curse uh or is the curse like the problem statement that i'm supposed to be fighting against and returning to the pre-cursed world Mm. like if i'm an agricultural engineer and i find a way to control thorns and thistles better or i find a way to make it easier for plants to spring from the ground so much so that we don't have to sweat, uh, work by the sweat of our brow so much, is that, am I doing something against the plan? Am I, right? you know, is it like cheating? Is it like taking drugs to feel a good feeling instead of going on a run? And with the agriculture thing, it doesn't matter so much, but then maybe you get to pain in childbirth and you kind of wonder like, maybe the, the evangelical response to, the pain of raising children and the pain of childbirth is to make it easier. Otherwise the best church would be the one with a horrible children's program. So they're like, it's supposed to be miserable. We're not going to make it easy on you. God said it should be hard, which kind of makes sense. So then what about patriarchy? Your desire will be for your husband and he'll, uh, his like domination shall be over you. His rule shall be over you. Hmm. Are we supposed to be on the side of the curse or is this the description of the world that we are trying to fight against? I see what you're saying. Yeah. So 
This is a tricky one for me to unpack. Um, just because I, I no longer see the creation story as a literal thing. I think it's, it's metaphorical or allegorical or whatever you want to call it. I think it's trying to teach a point. I think it's trying to make a point and teach us a thing. But I, either way, it's still, you know, what is this trying to teach us? Are we, is this just a, is this just like an origin story? Like why the spider has eight legs or is this, right. is it just explaining natural phenomena or is it actually trying to teach us a thing? And that's hard to do because if it's trying to teach us a thing, what am I supposed to do with this? Right. Yeah. That, you know? I, I guess that's, that's the question I'm even, even asking. Cause the, absolutely it is how the leopard got its spots. It is uh, this first part of Genesis is definitely fulfilling that part. It's like, what is the world? How did it come to be? And why is it like this now? You know, like yeah. any origin story, it's trying to explain that. So it's like, God made it and God made it good and God is good. Well, then why is like everything bad around me? Why is life hard? And why am I afraid of snakes? Um, <laughs> so I I absolutely think on on one level, it is just like, hey, here's why here's why the world is like this. Yeah. It's just explaining like, you know, just like any creation story or origin story. Yeah. But I don't think it's just doing that. But I think because I grew up with a lot of fundamentalism in me and fundamentalists, they take the literal surface level and stop. Yeah. And don't keep going. And the literal reading is just like, Here's how it is. That's why the problem is sin. The problem with the world is sin. Right. And that's, that connects to what we were talking about with the, these, like the gun violence or bad cops or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, racism. Yeah. You get to a worldview in evangelicalism where it's so easy to just like, say like, oh, I know the answer. The answer is sin. Like sin is why racism exists in the world sin is why we have to farm and work hard yeah sin is why we have snakes and sin is, yeah why labor hurts and why the patriarchy there's not even like i think there's an implied so the solution is not sin but you know that i think that's where those arguments fall short is people who are like well the problem isn't systemic racism the problem is sinners well, like well then what's the solution <laughs> right, because I mean, you you become a Christian and sins you are washed sinning? away, right? Well, your <laughs> sins are washed away in grace, etc. But I guarantee you, Christian women have just as much pain in childbirth, <laughs> right. and Christian crops don't grow faster. You know, I mean, yeah, these things don't exactly. go away, and so part of this feels like an ancient dude writing the explanation about why. Men are in charge because the woman done messed up. Yeah. And, and you yeah, shouldn't listen to the voice of your wife <laughs> and all this uh, and explaining why, why, why agriculture is hard, you know? And so I, I wonder if it's anything beyond that. Well, the, there are parts of this curse that, that, start to become themes in the rest of the Bible that are being developed. And then, yeah. you know, maybe by extension were written into this story for that reason. Um, so the really famous one is to the snake that you're going to have enmity between you and the, the snake and you and your off your offspring. And, yep. you know, you will, he will crush your head and you shall strike his heel has been taken as a, as a prophecy of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. um, Jesus being the descendant with a capital D who comes and reverses the curse. Right. But if he reversed the curse, why isn't this other stuff reversed? Well, that's the thing is the, yeah, exactly. And the, and the Eden narrative, Eden is supposed to be the world, how it's supposed to be. Right. And then this cursed world, my reading is that this is not how the world is supposed to be. The world is 
Like this is how it is. Yeah. But that was not how it was. It it was not supposed to be that way. Like this is the the fallen nature of the world is you yeah. know. And we I think that we read into that a lot of stuff as Christians. Recently I've struggled with the idea of any kind of a heaven with no pain or no work. Um yeah. as opposed to, you know, this curse which is like all of the work with none of the gain or like, you know, it's like the work in the garden, but without the the fruit that's also there freely. Yeah. And then there, these ideas come back to Jesus in the new Testament, who is the new Adam and who's bre- broken this curse. And I've always seen it connected to the death curse, which isn't even really like in there, mm. but is, I mean, obviously part of the story, but I hadn't seen like in our culture, in Christian culture, preaching about like overcoming the other fallen nature curses of, of mankind. And that, that I think that's where it becomes important is not, is like how it has seeped into our culture. Hmm. Um, because these are also patch- passages that are used for complementarianism um, and upholding you know, really authoritarian marriage structures. Yeah. And even this idea, I think the fundamentalist line of thinking that goes from, well, we know what the problem is. The problem is sin. Sin caused all these things. One of the reasons why it doesn't really extend into, and the solution will be that we're all better is because what they actually believe the solution is just stop sinning so you can go to heaven where you won't experience that. Like we don't even... Right. We don't even have an idea of trying to make it better here because we're in the kingdom now. That, that's kind of where I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. And and this is also where a lot of the concept of this is where original sin came from. The, the that that idea. Yeah, it's 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 born in the line, and we you know original. What is it? Complete depravity or? Uh, it's, yeah, total total depravity. Total total depravity. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if what we are trying to do as Christians or as followers of God are to, is, if what we're trying to do is get back to that Eden relationship, which everything in the Bible seems to be pointing toward that. Uh, I mean, cause like the first few chapters of the Bible are kind of a blueprint for the most of the Bible. Like yep. someone has a relationship with God, someone does something stupid, they don't anymore. And they try to get it back or they repent or whatever. And so if I'm trying to get back to that previous state prior to the fall, then these curses would be things that I don't want to have part of my life. I shouldn't be using this section of the Bible to say, um, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Well, that sounds like the downside of things. Let's undo that so we can get closer to being back toward the Eden scenario before we get kicked out. And I don't think we're, our churches are, or evangelical culture is interested in making anything better here. That's what I think we've missed is like the, uh, we're we're told this this curse, and then we have Jesus being the new Adam, reversing the curse. And then I think we we as a culture have we've decided that what's going to happen is we have this the, theology of heaven against earth, like that those two things yeah. are enemies, and that what we're looking for is we think eternal life means life that lasts forever and is. Um, in heaven. And we think that heaven means a spiritual, not this kind of place. Right. So then when we hear that the gospel is the good news of the kingdom of heaven, the assumption that we're making or the way that we live is that the good news is that you can go to heaven. The good news is that heaven is available to you now and that you, you get the ticket in. You can leave all this and nasty stuff. Just behind. like, Bear it as long as you can in this life, I guess. Yeah. Yep, there's all these thorns, but what are you going to do? Um, there's not going to be thorns in the next life. 
Yeah, and that's one thing that I have. I mean, we briefly mentioned that kind of concept with Brian McLaren last week, but yeah, that's one reason that this um, this concept of the Celtic Christianity is really really catching my interest because so tightly bound to the Celtic ver- version of spirituality and Christianity is the connection to the earth. Huh. Yeah. And it's kind of, think of it kind of like the, the indigenous re- religion of the people of Ireland and, and Scotland and Wales and, and the, and England and that kind of bleeding over into early Christianity and how, uh, in, in this, I'm reading this book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, by John Philip Newell. So he just came out with it, mm-hmm. and he, uh, he, 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 each each chapter is kind of like telling about a character in the history of the, the Celtic world of Christianity. And the first chapter is on Plagius. Um, not wait, familiar. That's that. Wait, that's a Star Wars character. <laughs> Dar- 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 <laughs> also, not. Fa- I'm not con- <laughs> familiar with either. What's his name? Uh. Pelagius, sorry, Pelagius. And Pelagius was in, what was it, like 4th or 5th century CE? And he was one of the first well-known Christians in Ireland, I believe it was. Anyway, wherever it was. Uh, but he was excommunicated from the church in the 5th century, I think, because he did not believe in the original sin idea. Huh. And uh, he thought that the everybody was by default sacred. Like when you're born, you look at a baby, you're like, that cannot be full of sin. <laughs> right? <laughs> so he, he was very adamant about everything is sacred. Every tree, every rock is sacred in some way. And so, and I really love that idea because I've, I've always hated the concept of original sin. And, you know, thankfully we didn't grow up in a, tradition that had that yeah uh, i was actually surprised to hear that a lot of the you know, like the mega church evangelical world is really bought into that still but I, I love the idea of losing that concept completely because sin sin is something that you do not something that you is in your flesh it's not in your body it's a spiritual thing and i also like the connection to nature because there's something about nature and uh, that um not that nature is god but i mean being in nature just kind of helps kind of open you up to realizing that there's more there than than you and that's why all these church camps are in the in the woods right yeah it helps that, that kind of makes me think like the i think what i'm hearing from that is like this idea of original sin is also tied to this idea that like our bodies are bad. The earth is bad and is going to be tossed away. Kind of like Gnosticism. Like my, my spirit is good, but my body is bad. Is that Gnosticism? Right. And so, so if you, if you're, if you're focused on material things being bad, then who cares what happens to the earth? Let it burn. Right. Yeah. We're, you know, the, we're, the faster it burns then the faster we'll get to heaven. And I, I kind of wonder if that's one of the biggest differences in mind view between either what we're calling like progressive and conservative Christianity, or even just the people who went through the past few years and found themselves breaking from their churches. I wonder if one of the main threads that went through it was this idea that the kingdom is now and the kingdom has responsibility to our neighbors now and to the earth or planet now, and that we should be making these things better. And that, that just feels so foreign to so many of the people we're sitting in pews with who don't really have the concept of actually like making the, making the kingdom come or, or working towards a future where the kingdom is here. Yeah. We're just like waiting to die so that we're not on the cursed earth so that we can be on the good earth instead of like actively fighting the curse. Yeah, Dallas Willard has a really good book. It's really, really dense, but it's really good. It's called The Divine Conspiracy. And in it, he talks a lot about God's plan, as he sees it, as described in the New Testament mostly, of 
this connection between the physical and the spiritual. Uh-huh. And the conspiracy just meaning conspiracy just meaning like plan, not like all shadowy, but not lizard um, people. <laughs> no. But the divine conspiracy is to come to earth to come, for Jesus to come to earth and to show us how to live and to bring heaven to earth. And one of the things he's pointing out is like when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that's off by people who are like, uh, kingdom of heaven is only, you know, quote unquote heaven with the harps and the clouds. Um, but what, and so at hand means it's coming soon. Yeah. But he's like, what really at hand means if I stick out my hand, it's something, it's at my it. hand. I, I can pick it up and touch it and, and, you know, manipulate it. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's, coming eventually you know it's like it's not oh, like it's here. Uh, the end is nigh right yeah yeah it's the kingdom of heaven is here it is at hand and he, he said what is a kingdom it's wherever the king has authority and so a kingdom of god is not some mystical place in the sky where you play harp and sing to god all the time it it is a place where god's rule is is enforced or where God's rule rules. So in that way, the kingdom of heaven is starts now. Eternal life is not a thing that starts when you die. It starts now. And so it really frustrates me when people, uh, again, mostly in the conservative evangelical world are so focused on just getting to heaven and Forget the earth, forget people. Uh, it's almost like if if these kids that were shot in Texas yesterday, if they're going to heaven, whatever, you know, move along. Or right, like who cares if we eat up the planet? I mean, there's so much more, and, and that and it, it's it is amazing to me. Like you mentioned, the progressive versus conservative or evangelical Christianity. You know, now that I'm at a progressive church, progressive Christian church, we actually have a ministry team that does nothing but ecolo- ecology stuff and and environment stuff. Yeah. It's so funny. That that sounds so secular to me. Like to my ears, it's right, like, right. wait, that's not religious. That is uh, the opposite of religious. Like that's not the stuff you're supposed to do or care about or thinking think about, which is because I'm so used to the idea that like we we literally should not care about that. Right, but if we're we we do know that we're supposed to care about people who are hungry and sick, right? Jesus yeah. made that clear. But if if I'm going to care about someone who is hungry and sick, but I am fine dumping oil into their water supply, that's a problem. <laughs> uh and so, I mean, taking care of the environment is taking care of the poor and, and the, the outcasts and, and look also yourself. And so the, the logic doesn't hold up. Yeah, man. And you like the, I think there are so many consequences of believing we're either here to uphold the curse and like make that our culture or just like survive until we're not in this cursed place anymore, but we're not supposed to be, I don't know, like salt and light to make the place yeah. better. Those are active things, you know, active things. And they're so you can pour through Galatians three and find Jesus being the new Adam, but also basically the, like, what does it mean to not be under the curse anymore? And, and what does that mean? And the word that we have for that is eternal life. Mm, yeah. And there, you know, Romans uh, has the idea to Romans five, First Corinthians fifteen, Hebrews two, of just like we're not people who are under the curse anymore. We don't have to live like that. We can, if we do. That's you know, Paul would call that like still living in the flesh, meaning like you're still stuck, like you're a cursed people. But we're supposed to be this new kind of creation right now, starting right now on the planet. And when you when your idea of heaven is that it's the good place that you get to go after this, but that 
we just have to endure this. Mm -hmm. You get some crazy, you have to do some things like figure out what the age of accountability is, (laughs) which does crazy things, but also starts to make you more intuitively uh, choose, like if as a evangelical Christian, if you pressed a button and you had to pick if that button killed I'm getting weird in, in this part. I'm waiting to the end of the oh, show. I love, I love, I love hypotheticals. Okay. You got a button in front of you and you have to press the button. Um, it's going to kill a random person on the planet, but you do get to pick. Is it going to be a child or someone who is elderly? If you are a Christian, what is the most ethical thing to do? Say that one more time. So you have to choose. Do you kill a rent? You don't know who it is. Don't know if they are saved or not. Okay. You have to pick between choosing a ch- uh, killing a child and and killing someone who's elderly. Hmm. Depends, well, I would say you know how, how much how much is original sin in this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What <laughs> denomination are we? Yeah, Which right. is a scary, a scary question. It's like were they baptized at birth? Because then we're good, right? Uh, or you know, yeah. But we have this idea as Christians that kids go to heaven no matter what. Right. It's just if you're past eight or twelve or thirty, I I put the age of accountability at thirty three when when Jesus died. That's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I can't argue with that. Yeah, I feel like that's like if you're thirty five, yeah, I'm I'm gonna hold you accountable for your actions. But in the in the mindset that all that matters is eternity, and you are trying to have the most souls go to heaven and the least souls go to hell and you believe in the age of accountability, you should kill the child because the yeah. child gets the automatic pass to heaven and you don't know if if the adult, you know, listened to a woman preacher or something that's going to disqualify him. So, <laughs> And then you get to things like abortion and now you're like, okay, you just want to farm souls to heaven? Then you should be pro-abortion. If you think that life in a soul starts at conception and you believe in an age of accountability then like what the best chance to not be a sinful atheist is to not be born. So why do you want to have them hatch and become like jerks eventually? And I think that these are like, nobody think like Christians don't actually believe this. There, there aren't evangelicals who are like, yeah, that's me. But there are poisons that have caused us to have those kinds of values. I think. And if our, if our idea is that not that we go to heaven, but that heaven comes to earth and when heaven comes to earth is when people act more and more like Jesus, then those things, uh, like those weird contradictions of like who gets to go into heaven don't make you make horrible, evil choices. They help you like, oh, well, you know, in the, I think the elderly person goes, uh, first of all, is the more like morally acceptable person. Yeah. To choose, not that it's either one is great, but like we are here to make it better for those people. We are here to advocate for life at the guillotine, you know, at at the execution and uh, in poverty and in like every stage of life. We are here to bring salt and earth. And I think we are people who are working to eliminate thorns and thistles are doing that work. And people who are making child care and child birth better and easier are like getting us closer to that Eden ideal Mm. and even dismantling the patriarchy. Uh, I don't know if that's what the writers of Genesis meant by that phrase, but that's at least how I read it. Well, dismantling the patriarchy and listening more to your wife. It seems like that's what kingdom (laughs) people would do. Not like, sorry, <laughs> like the, the punishment for listening to your, your wife is work. <laughs> That's why I have to work. Uh, one thing that I hadn't realized until I got into more, de- more detail about the beliefs of evangelicals in America is that I, I never understood why they hated abortion so much if it was just a shortcut to heaven. And yeah. it's not if you believe in original sin, because that, that tiny zygote is a living person with sin in them 
in their minds. And so you kill that thing and you send that baby to hell or purgatory if you're a Catholic or whatever. And that's pretty serious. I mean, that's, that's way more yeah. serious than just ending a life that is going to go to heaven. So in, in like, in that thinking with original sin, is there, is there not an like age of accountability? It's like, no. The, and that's, that's the confusing thing there. There's, they say that there's not because they say there is original sin, but they don't, a lot of the evangelical churches don't baptize babies. Yeah. Or they don't do anything at all for, to keep babies out of hell. Man, so, how scary. I mean, the, like the Catholic churches and like Lutherans and others, they, they baptize babies, even if they're doing it the wrong way, um, <laughs> because they're concerned about the baby's soul. Interesting. Yeah, it's so th- that's maybe more a a direct connection to the idea of original sin and a more logical approach if you believe in that, right? But and I, just I, like <laughs> we'll wing it, we'll just wing it for thirteen years and yeah, just cross our fingers. Yeah, but I mean, all this comes down to I I think I am officially very uh, anti curse. Let's kill the curse. I, I'm against the curse. I am. Because why would we want to perpetuate this system that is the punishment? Exactly. It's like, well, now you messed up. So now, you know, does this mean snakes are going to have feet in heaven? Okay. So here, yeah. Okay. Uh, you want to hear something cool? <laughs> I just recently, recently read about the snake thing. I don't believe it ever says that the snake had feet. Does it? Yeah, I mean, it's a serpent from the beginning. Like, it'd make more sense if it was like, then there was a lizard, and then at the end of the story, the lizard is a snake. That would make... That's how I think I interpret this story. That's how so it's always not been a, taught to us, right? There's no feet feet to disappear? Well, so here, here's the thing. So first of all, I thought this was fascinating that nowhere in Genesis does it, or the Bible, I don't... Well, Maybe Revelation. Nowhere in, in Genesis, at least, does it refer to the the serpent as Satan. It's not the devil. Yeah. I mean, the concept, yep. the concept of the devil is a more or less a New Testament idea. And so it's just a serpent. But when it never says that the serpent had feet beforehand. And this section about because you've done this, you'll go on your belly and you'll eat dust... Yeah. Apparently, this is very similar to um, some of the quote unquote pyramid texts in Egypt, in which they like they they describe what happens in the afterlife to the pharaoh and all this stuff, and they talk about the how um, the pharaoh is so powerful that the snakes remain on their bellies and eating dust. And oh, interesting. Because that is the docile stands for the snake. When a snake is ready to attack, what does it do? It rears up. Oh. And its head is like a foot above the ground and it's ready to strike. Interesting. And so yeah. what it what's, what seems what is being said here is you are going to be, even the we will strike your head and strike his heel thing, is you're going to be not powerful. You're going to be docile and 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 once again this is not talking about satan it's just talking about this story that this origin story of where we got this stuff and it's basically god saying you've been bad and i'm gonna make you sit in the corner now for the rest of your life <laughs> right yeah and uh but the uh, the other stuff is i think we need to do something about it instead of just embracing the 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 patriarchy and the all that and the I mean who who wants to sweat to sweat in order to eat bread right you just want to eat bread <laughs> yeah gross sweaty bread <laughs> almost as bad as spongy bread <laughs> the I, one other thing um like skip all the way to the end we start in Genesis you skip to Revelation and the picture of the kingdom coming or of heaven or whatever is literally that Eden is restored, that like people are let back in to where the tree of life is. Mm-hmm. 
and that its leaves are for the healing of the nations, which is just like another way of saying like for everybody. Yeah. Like the purpose of this place is to, is the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. We're going to be with God and eating a crop in its, you know, fruit in its season or whatever. And I think, you you know, we've got to place ourselves like I'm on that side. That's what I want to happen. And that's what I want to be doing with my life. Yeah. Starting with fruit, eating fruit. I'm pretty hungry. <laughs> yeah. There are things I used to think were not a big deal if you believed X or Y about it. Like, yeah, it's like whatever. Like the eschatology stuff, like the end of the world. I used to think... Yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't care what you think, whether it's going to be the rapture, blah, 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 the pre-millennium, post-millennium, whatever. And I used to think that stuff like this didn't matter because whatever. But the the more I get into this stuff and see how, like see where this stuff has come and where some of the behaviors of uh, the Christians in, in Brian McLaren's no section of the book... <laughs> got yeah. some of their ideas from i i start realizing that it starts with misunderstanding like some curses in the book of genesis or other things like that and so when you have these kinds of ideas then just the lot what's the next logical step and yeah. that thing those things happen and it's, and it's really unfortunate so i i think that I'm seeing more and more how important it is to properly understand this stuff or put it in the right context. Um, understand what it's really trying to say or what it really is or what it isn't. It's like the whole, is Genesis 1 science or not? If you think it is, then that means a whole lot of stuff. Uh, and it means that, and if you, if you think that uh, we are sinful from birth, that means a lot of things. <laughs> implications all over the place. Yeah, I think I'm in a similar place where I don't think it matters to get it right. Like, who cares if you guess right. what's going to happen at the end of the world? But those things do or can influence who we are or can influence right. our priorities. Right. And like, that's where we get into trouble. It's not like you have to get it all right, but it's more like it's helpful, I think, to actively look at your beliefs and see like what kind of a believer are they making you not just like do i believe the correct things but then like does that make me love my neighbor more or does that make me like think that i am exempt from loving my neighbor absolutely or does it make me you know what i mean yeah and that's actually a really good question to ask it does this belief <laughs> help me love my neighbor more uh yesterday for example i family and i went to the school board meeting. We just like stood outside because it was, we couldn't get inside. There was, it was packed, but just like to hold up signs, like supporting LGBTQ youth because there's some, some dust up in one of the schools about a, like a, a, a an allies club meeting. Long story. Anyway, we we're just there, you know, like our, our church actually put this thing together and said, Hey, let's, you know, let's all, let's come together. And they got a bunch of other churches in town and other folks, and um, there was a, of course, there was like, it wasn't really a protest. We're just like standing there, like showing support. But there was a protest against us, like on the other side of the, the entrance. And it was like, maybe we had like a, maybe 120 people and they had, they were like 10 or 15. And some of the signs that they were holding were not super loving. I mean, it wasn't like Westboro Baptist level, <laughs> but yeah. um, like one of them said, like, no, they're, uh, get rid of safe spaces in school. I'm like what? <laughs> safe space. What? Why don't understand. <laughs> Are there any left? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's, there's like, you know, that's a whole can of worms, this safe base thing or whatever, but seeing th things like that, it's just like, I kept thinking these people are wearing the name of Jesus and they're being hateful to these people and whether or not you agree with or if you're affirming or whatever 
of LGBTQ life, like treat them like people. <laughs> yeah. And when we get into treating people like not people, that's that's dangerous. And that, I love that quote. One of my one of my favorite authors is Terry Pratchett, which, for those who know who he is, outs me totally as a absolute nerd. He writes like what he wrote before he passed away: British, snarky, sort of goofy, sci- uh, fantasy stuff. And yeah. one of the I love he's got he's got fantastic societal commentary though and one of the things he said is um evil begins when you when you treat people like things and i I love that quote because that covers so much like are you treating a person like a thing right now or like an animal yeah. or are you treating them like a person if it's if you're not treating them like a person that's evil and so it all starts with our idea of what a person is and is a person sacred or is a person sinful? And I think at our core and disposable, right? I think at our core being people are sacred. God made us however he made us or they, however we were made by a deity. I think that we were built sacred and I think that it, Treating people other than that is a problem. Yeah. So if the thing is, if the thing is causing you to treat people as less than, uh, I think in like the biblical worldview, that thing is idolatry. Yes. And that the thing, it, kind of connecting it to the beginning, idolatry doesn't look like idolatry to your, like when you look back fifty years, you can see it. When you look back five thousand years, it looks uh, comical how idolatrous, you know, like worshiping a fake deity or Mm -hmm. sacrificing children or whatever. But when it happens now, you can't see it except for that you are harming people. That's how you see it. And that's how you can see if a system has idolatry in it, uh, is if it's harming people. And so if you're in a system that regularly harms people, and then you just think like, oh, they must have had something wrong with them, or they must have had it coming, or you know they weren't real Christians anyways, or or whatever, or their lifestyle is sinful. There's something that's causing you to be okay with the harm that's happening to them. You're elevating something above them, and it's not. Yeah, could be so many things. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's just like you open up the newspaper, and that's what I see is people who are more interested in money or power or war or fame or uh, being right or whatever than they are personal freedom. Yeah. I think in America, personal freedom is, has become an absolute idol. And well, I, I take that back. Personal freedom has become a God and idols are just representations of the God, right? And I think that's what guns are. I think they are idols of the the god of freedom. Yeah. America is not a Christian nation anymore. It's a it's a freedom worshiping nation. Yeah. We we saw a worship ceremony this week and we see them way too often. <laughs> Ouch. The freedom the freedom to uh take my own life or someone else's. Mm-hmm. Um the freedom to elevate myself at someone else's expense. See, part of my problem right now, Nathan, is I've been binge watching The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> yeah, it's dark. Yeah, so oh you're God. already in a dark space. It's, yeah, and it, it's like it's about to start its fifth oh, season, man. and I and I started oh. the first season like a few a couple weeks ago. And have you seen any of that? Yeah, and I. It just gets worse and worse and more and more depressing. And then it's just like every minute is depressing with like just no like the main character has a scowl printed on her face. And it's like at, me and my wife watched that for a long time. We, we were uh, catching up because I, I just started watching a year ago or so. Mm-hmm. Man, it's and we had to uh, we had to pick like short 
happy, goofy <laughs> comedies. Christy and I totally do that. <laughs> so it'd be like, like, we'd watch like two episodes and then I would, you know, my wife always wants to watch another one. She like, if we would just continue watching all, all night long. Um, and so I'm usually the one that's like, no, it's bedtime. But with Handmaid's Tale, we stop it. And then I turn on Brooklyn nine, nine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just for one episode just to like just as a cleanse yes totally oh man yeah so i mean i've been watching that and i'm like it, it uh, chrissy has has is way ahead of me she's been watching since it started coming out i read the book yeah. like 20 years ago and i was so depressed by the book that i'm like yeah. i can't watch that show because i know how bad it is and yeah. um i think the show's more depressing than the book really um but I started watching it recently and like, this is scary. <laughs> this is the world that, um, it's like, this is not, this is supposed to be a, a warning against, not a, a, uh, handbook on yes. how to do the country. Right. Yeah, exactly. It does feel that I think the, the thing I feel closest to in that show and book is actually the two USAs. Mm -hmm. Like the, just that idea, um, how a maybe religious but vocal minority takes power and how, but then how, like, just you split into, like, that part of the country and the other part. And I, I feel like, like, that's happening to us, but we're not, we're not having a war uh, and we're not, like, separated by geography, we're, but we're just as se separated as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> Well, this has been a uplifting discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now to some some Brooklyn Nine Nine. <laughs> no, it it really does help to talk through some of this stuff because you know it weighs on me all day long, and I think of the the children who were killed or the children who are going to be killed later because it's going to happen again, and you got to find a place to, in your mind to let this stuff live and. Uh, Get it out once in a while, and I don't know. Cope. I don't. I don't feel like we have a good practice of lament, and like reading through mm. like scripture. I, you see the, the like literal sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. Yeah. Tearing your clothes and screaming, and then s sitting and mourning for days. And in evan evangelicalism, we just don't have a thing to scratch that itch. We have thoughts and prayers. There's, I got two emails today. One was, we're going to pray about the state of this world and how divided we are and all, all the hate that kids see. And and then I got another one. Are we one. doing anything? <laughs> right. Yeah, I got that You one. know, yeah. guns optional. <laughs> and then I got one that was a lament. Uh, we are going to come mourn and sit with each other in lament. Mm. I was like, yeah, we don't need like... God, you're the only one that can solve this. So, you know, we're going to lift this up to you. Thanks to our security team in the back who has kept us safe. Amen. <laughs> uh, thoughts and prayers are not enough. It's, it's You got to do something. I don't know. Maybe I'll go watch an episode of um, Our Flag Means Death. That's a good show. Is that... That sounds depressing too. <laughs> no, it's actually... It's, it's hilarious. It's about... It's actually... a Oh, pirate! Based on a true story, it's a pirate, sh a pirate thing. Okay, I thought of the American flag because that's oh. how I, I keep <laughs> I keep Ooh. bringing it down. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> oh no. Yes, pirates. Funny pirates. Yeah, it's a it's a funny show. I, I recommend it. You have to check it. Taika out. Taika Waititi plays uh, Blackbeard. Oh, he plays Blackbeard. Okay. Yeah. So I'm soul, gonna like right? it. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep talking about depressing stuff if we don't stop better <laughs> yep wind it down the end uh well uh, more next more time. next time oh i uh, before we go we should point out that the next book club book is um love matters more by jared bias yeah uh, i don't know if we've announced it yet i don't think we have uh, yeah. yeah um we, we have actually already recorded the episode with jared bias which was fantastic and uh, in every way, but uh, it'll be c coming out in episode 55, which is we're recording 30, 52, 53 right now, so it'll be two, a couple more episodes away. 
but you know, link in the show notes and all that stuff. But Jared is the co-host of the, um, the Bible for normal people podcast, which is one of my favorites. And, uh, yeah. So read, read the book. It's, it's fantastic. And we'll have that episode soon. Subtitle, how fighting to be right keeps us from loving like Jesus. Yes. Which is like a thing we just say all the time. So. Yeah. Great book. All right. All right. See you nice. later, man. Good to see you. You too. Hey, thanks for listening. We hope you got something out of the episode today. Check the show notes in your podcast app for all the links and references that were made, or you can find it all at followingthefire.com. If you'd like to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash followingthefire to become a patron. And of course, we'd love it if you rate the podcast and share it with others. See you later. And I'll give you all my heart. Don't you know it's all I have? Even on my heart Can't compare with what you're worth I have been running Almost all my life But you You always chase me down